We started working together a month ago. You actually came to the Minnesota clinic and you had been working with um, a naturopath? The, uh, yeah, the naturopath and the hormone doctor. And, hor and hormones, like a endocrinologist, right? Actually, it was the yeah, integrative health physician. Okay, integrative health physician. Okay, and you, your symptoms were alopecia, which is hair loss, mm -hmm. autoimmune, um, mm -hmm. it's severe anxiety. Were you, isn't that right? You had severe anxiety. Yeah, stress. Um, I was just finishing up a tax season, so it was extremely intense. I was working probably 80 to 90 hours a week for probably a period of, um, I would say, minimum three months and then another three months prior to that. It was a little bit less than that. But So for a period of almost six months, it was heavy intense work and stressful, very stressful mm -hmm. work. Yeah, but you had been um, under ang this anxiety for years, right? Right. Okay. Yep. So the first session we had together, how did that go? Because you were um, believing that maybe you had a hormonal problem and it was body image or weight loss could fix it. Or what was your idea when you came in to see us? I mean, the the natural path and integrative medicine, they suggested you come work with us, right? To do the protocol. No. They no, didn't. I, okay. No, I just did that myself. I just thought with that that work schedule, I had gained weight as I do every year. And I thought, this is the answer. This is going to be the ticket for me. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to do this protocol and I'm going to get it all figured out. And you're going to lose this weight, and then you're going to keep it. Yep. Okay, so you came in. Did you have any idea that um, at that time, did you have any idea what this hour session was going to be like? No. No, I just thought that I was going to go through the instructions on the protocol, and um, I was going to get, uh, I don't even know, HCG, and that I was just going to go on and, I kind of had it planned out that, you know, when things were going to happen. And, I mean, it was the day after that, you know, my season ended that I just thought, okay, I'm going to just move right on to this next thing and we're going to get it taken care of. Yeah, and I remember that session clearly because I remember thinking this woman is in serious stress mode. Like it was carrying over. You had all these symptoms, right? Remember I was like, here are some yeah. symptoms. And you were like, oh, my God. That's yeah, me. It, it, right? It was so emotional. I just I didn't expect that I was going to start sobbing yeah. <laughs> when I went for this protocol, but it was like oh my god, it was so eye opening and it was humiliating. I remember saying it was it was humiliating and embarrassing at the same time. Yeah. Well, even with the humiliation and embarrassment of which I did not intend, right? No, it wasn't, it wasn't you that made me, I was feeling, as I was realizing things that you were pointing out, it was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Yeah, how did I not see this, and this is really right. actually what's happening, and holy shit, I thought I came here to lose weight, and here I am getting all this, this something completely <laughs> different. You decided to work with me, right? We put yeah. the protocol on hold, and we're doing all this work together. So now it's been a month, right? And yeah. you and I have met four times. Yeah. I Although some of those, months. there were a few sessions in there that were marathon sessions. But tell right. me today how different you feel about yourself, your life, uh -huh. your husband, your work, your kids, your symptoms. What have, What's happened to all those symptoms, right? Yeah, so my symptoms are... I, I I don't have hot flashes. I don't have um, I can sleep through the night. I don't I don't feel depressed and I feel very positive. I don't feel like everything's kind of a negative drag. Um, How much of that do you believe is 
due to the hormonal replacement therapy? Because you've been taking hormone replacement. Yeah, I mean, I. How much I would you attribute that, to that in terms of like a hundred percent of the change in your symptoms? What would you attribute to your shift of mind, and what would you attribute to the hormonal therapy? Um, that's a hard question. I know I think that the shift in mind is, is a, a much bigger player just because, again, I'm changing my perceptions and my beliefs, and I can look at myself in a whole different light. So, um, just from a month ago to now, it's like a, you know, a 180. It's, 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 I never thought that. I could look at a picture of myself and think, that's a great picture, Yeah. you know? So you just went to your daughter's college graduation. Right. And prior to this, you, you were saying that you loathe getting your picture taken because you always feel really bad about the way you look. It always just makes you feel awful, right? So you uh -huh. knew you went to this, you knew you were going to be getting pictures, you you were celebrating something actually quite significant. It's, this is a life, a significant life achievement, don't you agree, getting a college degree? And it's Absolutely. not only achievement for your daughter, but for you as a parent. And so you went to her graduation and felt a little apprehensive, right, because you were nervous that you would feel bad about the way you looked, but you took the pictures anyways. And then you saw them, and it uh -huh. did it take you by surprise how you felt about your pictures? Yes, because I thought that I was going, you know, immediately, my, my typical reaction is, yes, I want to see the picture, I have to see it, and I have to analyze it, and I have to see how I look, and if, I, if I'm, I think, oh, that's, I should be slimmer, I should, that's a bad angle, oh, that's, you know, bad. Yeah. So this time, when I looked at it, I immediately went and looked at the faces. It was my husband, my daughter, and myself, and I could see the, the joy on our faces. And I did, like I said, I did look at my body, but I didn't look at it in disgust. I just looked at the picture and I said, that's a great picture. Yeah, and, and it I, wasn't I because... I could feel that joy. I could, instead of looking at it in disgust at me, I was looking at the, the moment in time, mm -hmm. like what pictures are supposed to be. Yeah, it, and then it's the mind. meaning, right? It's the meaning of that picture is the, the joy, the excitement, the pride. You didn't yeah. see, you look like crap. Whereas before, it would have been like, oh my God, my stomach's too big. I look fat. I look ugly. I'm ashamed. Put it away. Right? We yeah. had actually said just a little bit ago, it's very self-centered to think that these pictures yeah. are about the way you look. Like, they're about the way you, right? Like, if you were to be, if your daughter gets married, you're going to be the mother of the bride. Mm -hmm. Is the first thing that someone who has been um, indoctrinated and brainwashed from the body image culture would think, I have to look the right way for me to enjoy the wedding, correct? Correct. I'm going to say it again. I have to look like this image for me to feel good about this wedding. As if the wedding is about the way you look. It's not about feeling good about the actual meaning behind getting married and love and commitment and loyalty and, heart. you know, it's like, like it's about your body, not about the marriage, right? So this is correct. And it makes you, when you pull back from it, it's like, wow, that's super self-centered. Well, yeah. Well, that's because the belief system is incredibly self-centered. That's how yeah, it works. I, they, they, they dangle this idea that everything is so much better when your body is thinner, when it has beautiful curves, when you have perfect skin, when your hair is done appropriately, when your waist is a small enough size and your hips are, your butt's big enough. And it's like you will have access to all of this joy of marriage, the joy of your children, the joy of all this when you're thin. And that's what it relies on, right? As if this is the, the you know, it's like a battery power to life. Like when you're thin enough, you get energy. To live, right? Right, right. 
And and what we're doing, and I was just saying this, is we're turning that off. We're actually letting that battery die. Mm -hmm. Right? And how and how it is affected how you perceive your body in relation to these things. Is it it does it did it take work? Did you have to convince yourself when you saw those pictures that um that it was good? No. I no, I I looked at it and I immediately went to the face instead of the body. But like I said, I did, you know, I ventured a little bit, but I still thought, it's okay, it's me. It's mm -hmm. not bad, it's just me, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really kind of a revelation of, yeah, I've been missing a lot of these moments and these because I am focused on the wrong thing. Yeah, they're overshadowed by that you don't look good enough. Right. As if the whole thing is about the way you look. Completely. Yeah. yeah. It's overshadowing. So when we make the way you look just a form of expression, it's not the end all be all of the the energy of your life. All of a sudden, you what comes out is the actual expression of life powered by itself. Right. When you said, I just saw joy and excitement and pride, like we're so proud. This is a beautiful picture. Why would you make it about your hips and waist? Right. In your right. jaw or your skin or how you're positioned so that you look different. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. just quite incredible, really. Mm -hmm. And it's great yeah. to see it when it's gone because you can see how ridiculous it is after the fact. Right. Yeah, you can feel the ridiculousness. It's like that is just crazy to even think that this celebration could be overshadowed by the fact that I no, don't have the body ideal that the diet culture presents to me. Like they've hijacked your celebration. Frank. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I, the, the humility that I, I felt at the initial realization was now replaced with that's silly, ridiculous, you know, so it's a different mindset too that, you know, I'm not embarrassed, I just think, okay, that's, that was just crazy and I'm, I'm in a different place. Yeah. What is the likelihood you'll go back to that? Man, I don't think I can ever go back to that, but, you know, I, I do have to say that I have to remind myself. Mm -hmm. And I, it's not just instant change. Yeah. My, my mind goes, it kind of wanders a little bit sometimes and I have to pull back. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not a perfect, you know, well, here, that's because I'm not perfect, but I mean, the whole, it, it takes reminding on mm -hmm. my part. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, you know, Boy. You haven't made the a full, complete decision. That's all that is. And I think that's great. I think for most people, this takes, you know, it, it takes recognition, right? The moment you feel bad and then you realize, hey, I'm not going to do anything about it. Oh, well, then why even bother? There, Don't you agree that there takes a little bit for you? It has taken you going in and out of the grieving cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that's normal. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't feel bad that you still have lust for that body at moments, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. The goal is that once you detach from needing it or even believing it's a possibility, once you have a full, complete detachment, you don't struggle. It won't happen. The same struggle going back and forth, will it will go away. But to me, having that struggle for many people is what it takes to eventually get rid of it. Right. Sure. Some people are yeah. so miserable, so insane, so in de depths of suffering. I think sometimes, too, when someone comes to the clinic in Minnesota without having this information first, once they meet with me and have this shock of, oh, my gosh, I need to change my approach. It takes a little bit more time compared to people who have watched all of my YouTubes and have been watching and understand this there's a different reaction from the people who just start versus people who have been preparing with watching these sessions does that make sense 
Yeah, but in in my mind, you know, it's like I I watched a couple of those, but I thought, oh, that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> that was just my denial that oh, I know that I don't I don't binge. I don't I don't have that. I yeah, I probably eat too much, but yeah, none of that pertains to me. That was my mindset. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and that's what a lot of people's mindset is when you're watching, listening to someone else. Right, you're listening yeah. to someone else, and you're you don't know what their scenario is, and you think your scenario is separate from everybody, so it must be different for you, right? Right. And and that can create, um, you know, even if what you're hearing makes sense, your bias towards your you need confirmation bias towards your certain scenario, so it's not going to work for you. So once we get going, either way. This happened to you. You didn't make it happen, right? So it does take a little bit more time. It does. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That does not make you not, that doesn't mean it's not working for you. It just means that you are, you are developing your own sensory system with it. You are developing your own awareness of where your body image triggers are, what makes you feel bad right? And you are learning how to dissolve it as it occurs. That's a very powerful learning curve. Don't you? That's a real learning curve. That's coming from you, not from me saying, here's what you need to do. Now do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really experiencing it. Yes. And it seems like every week something happens that I'm, I can apply these thought processes to, and it just, it's, seems to be applying not just to those but many things that happen you know a lot of the thought processes you know my sacred beliefs whatever I'm just realizing that how many of them I really do have and that how many of them actually that, cause a degree of suffering right right yeah it just um just getting through that fear is is a big deal and yeah. And we have yeah, to talk okay. about techniques, right? Like gambling and going into the risk. Be aware of the worst case scenario. What if the worst case scenario happens? What can you do to resolve that? Once you resolve that, what happens to your fear, right? Dissolves as well. So anyway, so it's been a process. Yeah. And definitely. this has been a great um, test of where you're at. Not where I want you to be. This isn't about me and where I want you. This is about... Um, being you being free from the vulnerability of body image ideology, truly, right? Mm-hmm. That you can accept yourself without conditions so that you don't have the same um, life defining shame, right? Right. Or pride, right? Because it goes both ways. Life defining pride in body image is just as full of suffering as life-defining body image shame. Did you understand what I just said? No, I didn't. I'm I'm going to say it again. Body image pride, life-defining body image pride, is just as full of suffering as life-defining body image shame. Oh, pride and shame, yes. What do you, tell yep. me tell me what to you life defining body image pride is Well in my in my thought process before was that I needed to be a certain shape or feel a certain way in order for me to have the validity or to exude a certain confidence and that would give me, you know, it would make, if, if I had that, then I could be proud and I could, you know, uh, I would feel great and I would, you know, everything would be, not even everything, but just a lot would be better. Yeah, that's the life defining, that, that that's the defining pride, right? That it will significantly improve upon my sense of worth, value, completion, Completion's a big one, don't you agree? There's a degree of completion that is in the illusion of that body image pride. Like, I'm complete. I've finished this. I've accomplished this. It's like getting a certificate, right? 
Yeah, like I have my shit together. Thanks. Yeah, kind of like, yes, right? Yeah. And if you attain that and, do, and actually project that pride, what does it come with? Well, then you have to defend it. <laughs> and Fear of loss? To, yeah, it's just constant and it's not, it's not really the way you expect it to be. Mm -hmm. It's no, because once what you expect it to be is that you have a completion and then you are, there is this bizarre sense of permanent freedom that you'll have with that completion. And it doesn't even occur. That that openness, that freedom that you bought into when you decided to starve yourself, right, doesn't exist. Because once you get there, it requires cons bigger work, obsession. You, it requires that you have paranoia, right? So that's the suffering with the pride, right? And then there is the suffering of the definition of not keeping that body image. So once you've attained the pride of body image and you have sabotaged through the paranoia, right, and fear process, now what do you feel like when you gain it back? That is uh, defeat and failure and all of that. Yeah, that and I have to fix it. Right. The I have to fix this. How does that feel being gone? Right. <laughs> right, because. Because that's really, don't you agree, the fact that we are not fixing what you thought needed to be fixed? Right. It was, it was really kind of a, I mean, completely eye-opening because I actually was trying and asking to, for my body to be healed when it really needed to be my mind that needed to be healed. It's kind of crazy. Well, would you have ever considered that by making the body image, health image, visual image, performance image, imp an impossibility, that it's not the resolution, you're not even going to, to uh, hope it as a resolution, right? Would you right. have thought that by eliminating that resolution or fixing, that you would have gotten an immediate reward? true physical visceral emotional psychological peace and freedom just by eliminating that what was your question that, how, would you have ever considered was, that when um, you said i need to fix this this is the source of my problem yeah. this is my stress this is this i need to fix that and what we did is said you're not going to use that as a fix what happened um, it actually became quite freeing in that at first it was a little discerning, but then realizing that 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 is a huge source of stress and kind of anguish that mm -hmm. so it and actually became like it was so I mean, it was freeing. Yeah. So in other words, you came in and said, "I have all these problems. This is going to fix it." Right? right? And what we said is, no, it's not going to. We're going to remove it from being the, the pro problem. Right? We said, right. we're going to remove this from being even in your scope of awareness. What happened to your problems that you thought needed to be fixed? Well, obviously, the, the symptoms went away. Okay. So, what I'm saying is this. I mean, if I can draw a picture. Here okay. is the body image that you think, I know you can't see this. Okay, here is the body image, right, in your mind that you think is the problem. And what we said is, no, this isn't the problem. We're going to eliminate this from even being in your scope of awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Someone would say, oh, well, then there must be some other thing that needs to be fixed then. So if I can't fix it through body image, there must be something else that needs, we are going to find another way to fix this, right? Right. Like the problem will then non transfer and we'll fix it a different way. But what happened when you got rid of the entire imagery of body image, body health, body function, completely, is the entire problem went away. Right. I accepted myself just as I am. Yes. Yeah. And the symptoms are gone. Right. 
gone. Right? Who would you have ever thought that your desire to fix the body was the actual cause of your problem? Not at all. How could it be? I mean, in my mind, it was like, well, that was the only thing that was wrong. <laughs> but so we get rid of the imagery. <laughs> we get rid of the, we, we say your body's going to stay this way for the rest of your life. So we are not going that direction to fix these symptoms. So just by saying and believing, because you had to go into this with true belief, not just like, sure, I accept my body for here and now, Robin, with your eyes all glazed over, like I'm just going to do what she says until I want, I'm going to do what I want. You actually said, okay, I'm going to go into this and I'm going to truly internalize this. Yep. I don't want to have to fix the body. I'm not going to fix this body. It is not an option. That was the solution. So all of your spiritual, psychological, physiological, psych, all of it, having all these symptoms dissolved when you decided that body image was not the solution and it wasn't even a possibility or hope. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it didn't require that we find another way to fix it. Because uh -huh. we got rid of the cause. I don't know if I'm creating a very good visual here with my words. Yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, I know we've, and we've gone through those, you know, scenarios of not, this is, even if I gained 50 pounds or, you know, all of that and, and being able to live with that. Yeah, going to being the mother of the bride with that, going on a date with that. If you were to get divorced and then go out and date again with that, I mean, completely and 100% removing body ideology from your scope of need, right? We took that out and... Going, and, uh, and going on vacation too because that was a reality that, you know, literally is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And trying to kind of visualize and go into that and see, okay, this is how it can be. And can, can I live with that? Yeah, I can. Because it's not about how I look. It's about those moments again. Mm -hmm. So you're removing the um, ideology around the body image how, and how it's been pervasively shoved into your belief system that you accept it. You had to accept it. So now that we've rejected it, so that's essentially what we're doing is rejecting it from possibility. Potato is on tilt today. So rejecting it from possibility. Who would have thought this could have been the outcome? I know. I really just went in to get the HCG shot. <laughs> we haven't even done it. You've not even started yet. No. No. I mean, I just feel like this is, I sh should have been doing this years ago. <laughs> well, you know what? It took you suffering to this degree to be tempted to do the protocol, which is kind of an extreme, extreme measure. So yeah. when someone comes, uh, when someone approaches us with, I want to do the protocol, we can, it's just it's like, you know, for this to be attractive, there's something extreme going on in their thoughts. Mm -hmm. There must be an extreme desperation. People don't have the same type of extremism with their body image beliefs or just aren't attracted to it because it looks like shit. Mm -hmm. Really, it actually does. Even though people who understand it, observe it, it's like a miracle. People attracted to it are crazy. Yes. Yeah. So um, here is where, you know, I... I we are not going to leave this, what I call this sweet spot of life. We're not going to leave it. However, mm -hmm. what I am presenting to you is the next step. So once someone has fully accepted and given themselves the grace to be fat, like I say, it's like coming out of the closet to yourself and to everybody around you. Here's my body. It's not perfect. It's not what you worship. It's not what's idolized. It's the opposite. I'm ugly and I'm fat and whatever. Once you come out of the closet and say, here's what I have, and I'm accepting it, and I am now going to be live free from feeling bad about it, which is where you're at. You're living free from feeling bad about it. It's, doesn't it feel great, right? Yeah, it does. You could stay here forever. <laughs> I, I know, and, and you should. I hope I am. Yeah. However, 
what I'm about to present to you is a real test of is this real or is this just a facade of convincing? Could you do the HCG protocol? Take away your food, take away this access to freedom, right? Because you have freedom for the first time with food without shame and guilt and arguing and convincing and negotiating the, the real suffering of dieting you are free from, right? We're going to go back into modification, restriction, um, lack of choice. The protocol is a severe program. And you get handed all this body image positive reinforcement. You're thinner, your clothes fit better, your body, you're hormonally going to be more easily balanced, although it's more vulnerable balance, right? We're going to give you your narcotic. You want your drug, we're going to give it to you, right? How does that feel? I don't know. It's a little scary. Okay. That's a sign you're not ready yet, but yeah. my goal as your guide is for you to be able to hear that and go, I don't even care. Like, what's the fright? Why, why is that scary? I don't even care if I lose weight, so I know I'm not going to manage it. Right. But my thought process is, do I even want to do that? You might not. Um, you might not, and I'm not going to sit here and say you have to. But as someone who is to guide your emotional well-being through body image addiction, right? We could say that's your ad. Addiction is the euphoria of the thinness. Being yeah. that that is your addiction, the ultimate test is to actually be handed body fat loss and your imagery and to see if you attach to it. Oh, okay. Right? So this would yeah. be like saying, okay, let's give you your body image. And if you are fully recovered, you will not diet when it's over. You won't do it. Mm -hmm. Which means you're vulnerable to the body regaining some body fat at its own accord. Do you see where I'm headed? Yeah, it's the true test of, you, I mean, putting on weight. Yeah, can you lose it and gain it back? Right now it's easy to accept, right? You came in with a body you didn't want and we got you to accept it. So let's yep. give you a body you want and see if you're willing to let it go, right? And what that means is we're taking out the bias. We're taking out the need, right? You're taking out yep. the, the illusions of grandeur. They don't exist anymore. If they don't exist anymore, you can be handed this body and you won't keep it. Meaning you will continue to eat to hunger when it's over. You will add back food in um, as you want to eat, right? It's like what you're doing with food now, you are right now to be eating the way you want to eat for the rest of your life, right? Uh -huh. You give yourself uh -huh. grace and freedom. Food is always available. It's never going to go away. Um, if you eat something delicious, you don't have to eat it all because it's not going away, right? There's none of this, um, this deprivation state of mind that exists anymore, right? Right. If yeah, you I have, guess. if you have still need and attachment to body image, it's gonna show up on uh, if you do a protocol. So it's just exposing where you're at. So to me, it's not a defining where it's not defining you as good or bad. It's just defining what's left. Okay. Right. It's easy to live in this state, and you can cover up unconscious, unconscious things that can still exist. Doing a round of the protocol, what I found is that it just exposes all sorts of baggage, right? And it exposes itself when you have to defend your weight loss. What do you still have attached to it? What are the needs in your life that you didn't think you had until you lost weight, right? So I am not going to say you need to do this now because I do believe that it, it, there is an appropriate amount of time that when someone for the first time in their lives has given freedom from feeling bad about themselves, feeling free to eat food, that you need to stay here as long as you can and want and need. Okay. Once this becomes like the norm, I feel good. Food is easy. I don't have shame or guilt. Nothing can convince me to go back into dieting because it's crazy. You see the crazy for what it is, and you're no longer lured into it. Once you have that sense of confidence in your um, worthiness, can you be uh -huh. handed body image? Can you be given the imagery? 
and know that it's fake. The illusions. The illusions are fake and not grasp onto them. Right? When you feel I could lose weight and it doesn't affect me. I don't care. I don't care. I wouldn't even use it to my advantage. Right? In a in a culture that admires and worships body image, I wouldn't even use it. I wouldn't discuss it. It doesn't become me. Right? That's when we do this. That's when I that's when I say, "All right, let's go. Let's do it. Let's challenge your imagery, your attachment system, whatever that is." Let's challenge it and see where you're at. Not to see if you pass or fail. It's more to see what exists that you're not aware of. Because if you have confidence in this, why wouldn't you want to test it? Right? Uh -huh. That's just a possibility I'm, I'm presenting to you. Okay. Do you feel nervous? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, don't, um, I, I, did, I want you to not think that I'm not pushing you into doing that. I'm not. No, I know, I know that. And I don't have the expectation. I don't expect you to do it, and if you choose never to do it, there, to me, that's like awesome. You don't have to do it. There's risks that come with it. Because you could get sucked back into that diet mentality and the suffering. I've seen it. I've seen it a lot. So... There is no yeah. expectation. In fact, just stay where you're at. Don't worry about anything. The other thing too is that if you have alopecia, it can cause it can actually make that worse. So don't even think to start it until you feel that that is resolving. It's on the mend. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, what are your thoughts on what I've presented? Um, the, the rationale behind it, you know, I, I never, I never would have thought that you would have, or that it would be used in order to find things that are still unresolved. So that, that, that's a very, um, interesting thought process. And I'm thinking, I'm maybe a little afraid that maybe there is more that's unresolved. I don't know. I Maybe that's what my fear is. It's like, oh, what else is there? <laughs> well, we're, you're still resolving through them right now. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I said, oh, you're. This is. I'm presenting this to you before you're ready. Because you're okay. still naturally resolving issues in the real world. So once you get yeah. to a place, you're like, oh my gosh, nothing in the world is going to make me feel bad about the body I'm in. There's nothing in the world. I could get my arms chopped off. I can get a car wreck. I could get burns. Nothing is going to take away from the gratitude I have for the life I have mm -hmm. right that is a process you are going through in this moment okay once you get to where you feel really secure and you've had lots of different you know triggers and challenges and you're like ah, doesn't affect me I'm not affected by it you might uh -huh. actually say holy crap I, I I might be this protocol might be something I'm willing to challenge myself with because if I truly have this confidence that I feel about you know, this separation between the imagery of the body and its function and my sense of worth and confidence. If there's a true separation, you should be able to lose weight and not get high off of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole different perspective. And I, I see what you're saying. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, there's, I think that there's part of me that, is interested in that, but I just don't know that I'm quite there yet. I know, I would agree. I'm hearing you, and I'm like, oh, you're just not ready yet. That's okay. We, You want to be ready. So you need to keep on working through this. But that's the ultimate, um, ultimately, the, if you actually have the body fat available, right? Because the protocol is not okay for people who are thin and, you know, functioning anorexic. Right, uh -huh. you are very thin, even though they think they're fat. It's not not cool. People yeah. do that all the time. They want to lose five pounds on the protocol. <laughs> warning, warning, practitioners, you might want to consider what you're doing by prescribing that to someone who thinks they need to lose five pounds. Um, yeah. So if you have adequate body fat, then this can be safe physically. 
psychologically it's still going to be a risk. But that to me is not, again, it's not a definition of failure. or It, it really is just getting bearings. Where are you at? What is left, right? Yeah. So we can get in there and get rid of it, right? And work on it, resolve it, be aware of it. And the end result of where the body body's fat lands to me is like, I don't even care. Yeah. Having body fat is actually very healthy. The fact that the body gains fat is a sign of health, right? Yeah, it's just so interesting and so appealing actually to kind of get rid of every little nook and cranny of that craziness. Mm -hmm. And that's my goal. That would be yeah. my goal as your guide. And I'm here to just work with where you're at. I don't have a goal of telling you what to do. I'm just saying here, here's the, here's an, here's an idea. If it matches mm -hmm. for you, then we can do that. If you're ready, I wouldn't recommend it right now just because of how your reaction to it is. When you said, I'm scared, I said, does it scare you? And you said, yes. I'm like, it's not ready. Yeah. Not ready. I wouldn't recommend yeah. it. You're not getting a prescription right now. Not going to happen, even if yeah. you wanted it. I know, right? I'm not going to do anything that's not going to be um, to your um, greatest good that I'm aware of. Right. How do you feel? Yeah, thought, uh, go ahead. I never thought I would say that. <laughs> I never thought I would say, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to. I'm not ready to do that protocol. <laughs> and that, that was my whole goal going into this, to, to do the protocol. <laughs> well, now you see that now you're aware of the suffering you were in. You had no idea you were suffering to that degree. You just thought you had some, some hormonal and biological problems. Mm -hmm. Right? And once we get rid of the actual cause and you have this incredible amount of freedom, it's kind of hard to go back. It's like, mm, no, I'd rather be fat. No, I'd rather have fat on my body. <laughs> you know, and, but what about type 2 diabetes? Oh, I'd rather have type 2 diabetes, actually. I'm not afraid to die, but I'm certainly afraid of psychological illness because I've been there, and it sucks. Right? Yeah, definitely. I <laughs> I know you say that now. Yeah, I didn't know that <laughs> a month ago, but... Uh, I know, yeah. but if you had to go... So, for example, if you had to go back to where you were a month ago, would it, wouldn't you rather just gain 20 pounds? Yeah, probably that would be easier. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. It's like, no, I'd rather be fatter than to go back to that. Yeah. Loathing, self-conscious, uh, feeling inadequate, feeling like you're a failure, constant pressure to diet, which increases your eating. People that have constant pressure to lose weight, I have to lose weight, I have to lose weight, I need to lose this weight, they're constantly eating. They have, I get food, I just have to eat it, and they think the food is the problem. No, you have a constant need to diet, which means that you're going to be feeding. It's like procrastinating. The constant urge to eat that goes along with a constant urge to lose weight is like procrastinating. That's what that is. I'm eating to procrastinate because at some point I have to do this and it's overwhelming and it's heavy and it's burdensome and it feels like it's so beyond the scope of capacity. So you constantly feed. Anyways, so you don't necessarily have to be a binge eater. <laughs> well, that was what another thing, you know, when I was, looking at the videos, it's like, well, I'm not a binge eater, but I, yeah, but the whole, that whole definition, I mean, not that I'm not a binge eater, but I'm, I do exactly what you were saying about procrastinating, you know, and eating because I'm dieting, you know, and I'm depriving and it's all that, it's just all messed up. Yeah. A lot of people say, Robin, I never diet. Well, bullshit, because the diet actually is in the belief that I'm going to lose weight. I need to lose weight. I have to lose weight. Someday I'm going to lose this weight. The pressure of knowing that it's looming over your head at all times for decades. Yeah, that's me. Okay, that is almost everybody listening to this video. Yeah. 
Yeah. But isn't food a narcotic? Isn't that what makes me hungry and like makes me want to eat? I just have constant cravings for food. What happens when you get rid of the idea that you're going to lose weight? What happens to the need to lose weight? What happened for you? I am not hungry. I, I know. And it's not even about hunger. It's about being deprived or feeling the impending need to deprive yourself. So, so incredible what happens when you decide you're going to come out of the closet and say, look at me, everybody, I'm fat. Throw your stones. Throw your arrows and tell me I suck. I'm done. It's quite incredible. I, I mean, it's, it's not anything that I ever thought about. I just, and I knew that, well, I shouldn't say I knew. I guess it, it became clear to me that I was obsessed with it. I never thought while well, I was doing it, and, and I thought I was promoting that healthy lifestyle to my family yeah, and that's parents. the wolf in sheep's clothing yeah it's just crazy that it was so opposite of that do you see that now yeah i can see it really clearly now and how it all just you know everything is like cogs in the wheel it just everything perpetuates the next thing and it's just and it's all because of me and my crazy thought process it's not your crazy thought process it's the diet culture's crazy thought process you just internalized it and thought it was sacred remember the sacred you right. never questioned it you just thought whatever they yeah. say it's got to be right it's so I true it you yeah. did you actually said they must know what they're doing and I don't so therefore whatever they say is sacred and I will hold myself to it all the yeah, media all the fear that than myself. It was just, oh. Well, do you feel like you're out? Are you out of it? Did you leave the cult? <laughs> yes. I mean, and but like I said, there are still moments where I, I have to remind myself, you know, but it's, they're getting fewer and further between. Yeah. I can say that when we, when we first talked about it, it was like, uh, but I just kept kind of processing and, you know, going into some of those fears. And so that, that helped re revisiting some of those things and really those scenarios about mother of the bride and the, um, gambling thing in mm -hmm. the, um, vacation, you know, that whole, you know, just kind of unraveling, like you said, those items really helped me to think, and it became clear that that's just nuts. Yeah, well, and as you release yourself from having to lose weight for a wedding, having to lose weight for a uh, vacation, because, you know, all of those things are about the way you look, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What you'll notice is that this impulse to eat just goes away. It doesn't require work or self-constraint at all. It just naturally occurs. Right. It just, it does, I don't even talk about that. How often do I talk about it? Not really. I'm the one who would bring it up and say, well, I'm eating to hunger, and I'm really not eating much, and are we... It was maybe five minutes of a conversation, and then because it's really not important, mm -mm, it, it's, it's not. not. Yeah, it's not consuming me anymore. No, it naturally it's happens, not. so I don't have to go in and micromanage. How are you doing with your hunger skill? Is it perfect here? Is it perfect there? You'll naturally evolve with it. You'll go. Well, I want to go on a right. date. How do I do this with a date? You're going to naturally have your own own reconciling of that, right? Yeah. But it's very, very difficult if you need to lose weight to get any of it done because there's this constant urge to feed in preparation for deprivation and because you feel bad about the food you eat because there's still morality with food. So as soon as you go into body awareness and acceptance of what you have and you completely eliminate, I am talking 100% elimination of body image expectations and needs, all of a sudden the... There is this incredible melting, right, 
and relaxation around food. So there is no, I still feel bad about food, even though I'm getting freedom to eat it. No, you don't have to convince yourself that it's okay. You just, it's always going to be there. There is no fear of it anymore. You don't sit there and go, oh my God, there's going to be cake. Oh my God, oh, what am I going to do? No, and, and just having my daughter's graduation, we had a little get together after that and um, tons of food. And, you know, there were some really awesome cupcakes. And the first, I didn't have any that day, but the next day I thought, I really wanted to, I didn't get a chance to taste one, is what happened because I was so busy. But the next day I thought, I'm going to have one of those. And I did. And I didn't feel any guilt. And it had gluten in it. Oh my god. Did you have like this incredible crazy impulse to keep on eating after that? No, I didn't. I was totally fine. It was just satisfying. And I didn't, I wasn't thinking about that cupcake all night or anything. I just saw it the next day because they were out. And I thought, oh yeah, I think I want to have one of those. So I tried it. And it was done. And it was good. And, and even since then, I've had regular pizza with regular crust, you know, not the gluten-free crust. And, and I, you know, before, my like pizza, I could just not stop eating pizza. And I had two pieces, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so full. I think I ate too much because I burped. And it's like, okay, so I'm good. I don't need any more. And the pizza could sit there, and I don't have to eat it all. Well, yeah. Well, because you realize, too, if you keep on eating, you're just mutilating yourself. Right. What's the reward of overeating that? There is none. Right. However, if you're going to go on a diet or you need to diet, the reward is that you're getting it right now because you're not going to get it then or later. Yeah, the, the food thing is just, that's probably the easiest thing that I've, with here. I know. I it is say. easy. But it's not easy if you stop to lose weight. Right. It's it's like impossible, actually. Yeah, I remember when I would be working out with my trainer. And I'd come back after my training session, I would have like, I called it pregnant hunger. And it was just like, I could not stop eating the rest of the day. Yeah, body image will do that. If you went and worked out like that now with this totally separate separation from the body identity, how strong am I? How fit am I? How much can I prove myself? Um, how do I look? What are my muscles doing? All that identity around the function of the body, specifically to how you look and your health, right? And it really can wreak havoc with your rhythms. So people who don't have the imagery, but they like the strength and they, they feel it's rewarding within the system of itself. They don't necessarily have major hunger swings. I trained, I trained very intensely in a variety of different ways for over 13 years. That's my, I mean, my degrees in exercise physiology, ACSM, NAS, NASM, CSCS, I mean, the amount of education I have in actual fitness and training and blah, blah, blah. I'm a certified strength and conditioning coach, for God's sake. People who don't have the body image motive behind it have a natural adjustment with their body in terms of hunger, and they don't even talk about it. Uh -huh. It's like some days they're hungry or some days they're not. Sometimes they're done with a workout and hungry. Most of the time they're not. And it's not, it's not even in their scope of, of like discussion because they just go with it. It's like, whatever. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way, with all Thank this you. progress that you've naturally just given yourself. Pretty amazing. I know. Thank you. Yeah. Because it's not hard, is it? No, I mean, the, it takes some thought. Well, of, of course. It takes contemplation. Yes. Contemplation <laughs> and letting things go, right? And the gambling. What's the risk? Can you handle that risk? And then mm -hmm. being free from there. Thinking. Right. 
It doesn't take force. Have we forced anything here? No. And I honestly have used that worst case scenario in many different aspects. I've used it at work. I've used it at home for just different things that are happening that I would normally get freaked out about. And it, it helps me just go through the process and just the, the, the craziness or the, the stress kind of dissipates with that whole mm -hmm. unraveling. Yeah, you're learning to unravel stress as it ravels, mm -hmm. right? Because your stress comes from fear, and fear comes from feeling inadequate or incapable of what you don't want. So you go into what you don't want, find um, find a way to see it, right? Mm -hmm. From a logical perspective, if it's not worth the risk, you don't take it. If it's a risk that you think you can handle the loss because you're curious, you want to find out, then it doesn't be, then the stress completely just melts, doesn't it? Because yeah. then, then you're fully accepting ahead of time the risk. You're not avoiding the risk and hoping for the best. Right. You're accepting the risk and, and open to anything. Right. It's a really powerful tool that I thank you for sharing that with me because I, they use it all the time. Yeah. Well, before you just assumed that your fear was real, didn't you? And it was true. Right. Right. So it just right. yeah. freaking rules your life. I mean, you're living in a state of fear. But when you go in and you question the fear, you go into your fear, you stop avoiding it, you look at it, you dismantle it, you figure it out, all of a sudden what happens to fear and risk? Right. It's gone away. Totally. Totally, and um, it really improves your reactability, too. So you go into something, and you say, ooh, I want to see what happens here. The risk is this. Okay, well, can I handle that? Okay, yeah, yeah, I can handle that. So in worst-case scenario, I can handle this. So now I'm open to see what happens. Once you go through the experimentation of whatever it is, a choice or um, whatever, then you see the outcome, and you go, oh, I never would have predicted that. Okay, yeah, now I'm going to adjust around it. So it's a natural, progressive learning curve that's present in the moment of each moment. Another thing that you said that really kind of um, stuck with me too is that once you do that, if you're not making those decisions in fear, that through that comes creativity and wisdom and, and you make decisions in that, in that respect instead of through fear and those those decisions are better decisions. I mean, because it's a, it's not driven by the fear. Yeah. Well, if you have fear, then your decisions are relative to that fear. It's like taking your choices and putting it into a tiny little box, because it always has to be in avoidance of fear, right? Right. Yeah. Whereas if you go into your fear, accept that vulnerability, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the box gets really big because now you have choices. And you're, right. again, that prefrontal cortex and all of this organization occurs, gets more active. It's not limited by fear. It's not limited to the scope of, well, I have to do everything that avoids this fear. If it, if it makes that fear bigger, I can't do it. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. So as soon as you accept your fear, you have a ton of options. And that totally improves your logic, intelligence, wisdom brain capacity and can you tell yeah for sure and just even saying the words what's the worst case scenario can I live with that and and I've even gotten to the point where nope I don't want that risk so therefore I'm not going to do it I, right so then I yeah it, and I you would think that you say yeah okay it's everything but you don't it gives you some parameters of what you're willing to do or not and mm -hmm. I, I think that I've said yep I'm willing to more than I haven't but it still gave me the wisdom to think yeah that's not really a good choice based on these circumstances so so you're willing to have a boundary yeah yeah, yeah, it just yeah. so people who are stuck in fear stuck in the fear-mongering, fear state of mind, they would say, hey, with an open mind, 
you just don't you need boundaries they just assume without fear based box living that you're going to die right but actually what happens is you become more directive around your own boundaries so the boundaries are now adjustable so it's not that you don't have any boundaries right you actually have a far more freedom at this point and you have a internally regulated boundary yeah and it's not yeah it's it's a you're choosing it logically you know not by fear like it's not within the small box totally it's bigger yeah it's relative to what you know right now in this present moment and ultimately by saying no that's a risk too and you have to be okay with the risk of saying no so you're just right. you're you're navigating for yourself within your own scope of awareness and now you're more likely to have progress expansion versus yeah. versus it closing in so all right i'm going to end this session um thank you so much for sharing this no problem thank you Robin.